Greetings, everyone, and welcome to the Produce Buzzers Podcast. We are so happy you have joined us today, and I think you will be too after the show is over, because you will learn a lot about fresh fruits and vegetables, how to select and store them, how to prepare and cook them, and surprising facts about their history and origin. We hope it inspires you to eat more fresh fruits and vegetables, not only for your health, but also for your delight and pleasure as you explore their amazing world of taste and delicious flavors. Eating more of them will transform your life in so many positive ways. So settle back, relax, and get ready for another delicious adventure with the Produce Buzzers. Greetings, fruit and veggie fans around the world. Thanks for joining us once again on the Produce Buzzers podcast. I'm Edwin Stepp, your host and executive editor of ProduceBuzz.com. I'm joined once again by Teresa Nolan, the president and founder of Produce Buzz, along with Rick Stepp and Cynthia Benedetto, both contributing editors to Produce Buzz. We have a very special guest today that's going to talk about something a little different than we normally talk about on the Produce Buzzers podcast, but something that's very important, and I think something that will give you a lot of confidence in your produce buying. Today, we have Tracy Fry. She is the account enterprise account director for a company called iFood DS. iFood DS is a company whose principles first came to the produce food safety scene in 2006, following an outbreak of E. coli in spinach. The company offers a comprehensive food supply chain platform for food safety, traceability, and quality management iFood DS enables hundreds of participants across the global food supply chain, that's growers, shippers, packers, processors, distributors, food service, and grocery retailers, to optimize the safety, quality, and value of their offerings with real-time supply chain visibility and the confidence they are supporting industry best practices. Tracy built her career working with technology startups focused on facilitating digital transformation. At iFood DS, she works with partners across the fresh food supply chain, helping them to digitize their food safety and quality initiatives. Tracy is an avid cook and describes herself as an all-around enthusiast. We are going to focus today on the food safety issues and the quality issues in the food supply chain. Tracy's going to t- talk to us and tell us about that and what's happening in, new in that realm. But first, we want to learn a little bit about Tracy. Tracy, what does it mean to be an all-around enthusiast? <laughs> I'll tell you what. Um... You know, I heard Anthony Bourdain describe himself one time as an enthusiast, and I thought, you know what, that is exactly how I would describe myself, and I, I, I picked up his term, and I've used it ever since. You know, I'm a lifelong learner, and I have, you know, since I was a, a small child, I'm curious, and I'm interested in what's going on around me, and I'm one of those people that when I find something a little thread somewhere that catches my interest, I need to understand everything about it. Um, I need to, to, to try it. I need to walk it and taste it and get out there and understand it. And so uh, that's really been a theme throughout my life, whether it's, you know, um, outdoor activities or cooking or culture. Uh, so that's really what that means to me. That's fantastic. I don't think I've heard that uh, expressed that way or even heard it, the term used as enthusiast, but certainly Anthony Bourdain captivated a lot of people with his travels around the globe, and he had to be that curious person to, to be as successful as he was, so that's fantastic. So uh, how did you then, you, you started with a tech background, how mm-hmm. did, tell us a little bit about your background and how you wound up at iFood DS. So I really, as I mentioned, have, have spent my career working in the technology space that's included, um, you know, different companies o- over the last two decades, 
focused on, again, transforming um, industries and verticals that were on the edge of digitizing their processes. And that might be advertising. You know, I worked in a company that was focused on um, AI, another one that was focused on e-commerce. Most recently, um, I was working with a company that helped um, uh, transform uh, the, the, the vehicle sales process to allow you to do that completely online. Oh. Uh, that company was acquired. And um, as I was thinking about what my next move might be, um, I connected with uh, some of the folks I had worked with at a previous startup uh, going back 15 years. We worked together for quite some time and uh, they were here at iFood DS. I started digging into the mission here and really found that that we again have an industry that is is ripe for digitization, and um, you know the, the efficiencies that come with that. Certainly in the food safety space, um, transforming, giving you visibility throughout the life cycle of your food from the time that it is planted all the way to the time that it hits your plate. Um, I was surprised, and I think a lot of people would be surprised that still much of the work that we're doing um, outside of the obvious things like planting and harvesting are done manually, whether that's yeah. tracking, you know, where something started, what happened to it while it was growing, and then what happened to it while it was getting to the grocery store. It's really fascinating stuff. Yeah, that that's uh, very interesting. You told me that you are re- fairly new to the produce industry. I suppose this jo- this this position is your first in the industry. Is that correct? That's exactly right. Yep. Yeah. One of the first things you noticed is that maybe the industry is a little bit behind technologically, but that's kind of to be expected considering that we're growing a product which, uh, you know, is dependent upon Mother Earth. That is exactly <laughs> weather. right. But it's becoming more increasingly more uh, digitized uh, technologies coming into it. What have you seen that has maybe surprised you to see the industry from a different perspective? So I think there's a few things. Um, first and foremost, you know, I always thought that I had this really clear sense of how food was grown, um, what it took to, to get to us. I grew up in in um, an agricultural community where we had a lot of orange farms, sugar cane, um, and a lot of uh, you know produce farming was happening as well. What I did not realize was everything that happened throughout the supply chain. You see something growing in a field, but then ultimately to get that produce from a field um, through um, distribution centers, right? The uh, the transport that happens to ultimately uh, get something onto a grocery store shelf and a, um, a consumer's plate. There's a lot that really goes into that. Yeah. Um, a lot of people who are working behind the scenes to coordinate everything that's happening there. I'm fairly new to the produce industry. So I cannot help but share everything that I'm learning with all of my friends and family. And the other night we were at a dinner party and I was explaining the process of receiving bananas from South America into a huge warehouse and the inspection process. And I realized that I was putting everyone else to sleep. (laughs) So interesting. Yeah, if you've ever seen uh, any of the videos that the banana industry has put out about the long journey from the, the what do they call them? Do they call them groves or banana orchards or what? <laughs> that long journey. Plantations. To plantation. <laughs> yeah. That's not a good word to use right now, I don't think. But anyway, that long journey to get in here and then you can go into, uh, you know, some of the discount retailers and find bananas for 39 cents a pound. What a bargain. (laughs) That was my point exactly. If anyone knew uh, the journey that they came on and all of the work that went into getting them onto the grocery shelves and into your home, number one, you'd never throw one away. And number two, (laughs) when you see it for 99 cents a pound, you'd say, glory be, this is, it's a miracle. (laughs) Yeah. I I also compare that to being able to put a 50 cent stamp on a letter and get it across country. That's right. (laughs) That's pretty good too. (laughs) Yeah. Can you actually buy 39 cent? per pound bananas in Massachusetts now? Uh, for a while, we were able to. Yeah. Uh, and that would be at the Walmart store. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I haven't checked to see if their prices have gone up or not, but um, they they always kept their bananas low. It's, uh, you know, yeah. like, as you know, those are sometimes lost leaders to, mm-hmm. to bring people into the stores in ho- hopes that they'll be buying other things. And not just produce in a store like that, 
you know, clothing and tools mm -hmm. and car stuff and all that kind of thing. Yes, our food supply chain is really a miracle. But sometimes there's problems in that supply chain. And that's one of the issues that you and your company are focused on to help solve. Tell us about food safety in that supply chain and what is being done to prevent foodborne illnesses and the like. From a food safety perspective, everything that is tracked and traced as something is growing, whether that's uh, the water that's being supplied into the growing atmosphere, all of the tools uh, that are used throughout the growing process, um, all of the, the safety components of that are actually tracked and traced from end to end. Um, I never realized the thought that went into that. Today, in many examples, that's actually done manually. Some of the work that we're doing at iFoodDS is to digitize those processes. Yeah. Well, tell us more about that. Can you talk about these technologies? What are some of the technologies that are being applied to digitize? I mean, for instance, you know, you think about the water you mentioned. Often uh, that water can be a source of E. coli and other diseases, uh, how can you digitize that and, and, and make it less manual? So one of the things that's happening um, is uh, growers are testing all of the water that's used on and around a growing area. Um, that testing is always going to be done manually. Uh, one of the things that we're doing is digitizing the records around that testing. Um, the testing that happens on the soil that something's being grown in. Again, the harvesting equipment, all of the safety protocols that would happen around harvesting. Uh, iFoodDS is digitizing those processes. And what ultimately happens when you're able to digitize that, removing it from a, a, you know, a pen and paper and, and a filing cabinet somewhere is in the event that we ever need to look back, uh, you know, in, in the event of an outbreak, we can really quickly in a matter of minutes, pull up the entire life cycle, everything that happened to a piece of produce from the time that it was, was seeded all the way to the time it was harvested. And then ultimately the rest of its life cycle. Yeah, that's fascinating. When you think about technology, a lot of what we work towards is, um, is taking data to be able to create a story uh, that you can use to be more predictive overall um, throughout, you know, whatever the cycle is of what you're doing. And, right. um, you know, when we're doing that from a, a food safety perspective, we might be um, digitizing the data for these processes that are happening. And again, we can digitize that data throughout the transportation process um, and then recognize what the quality of something is at the point that it's delivered to a retailer. And once we have that full picture of data, it actually allows us to, to really be more predictive around what quality might be like based upon different factors that are happening during the growing. So again, driving better quality produce overall for consumers. Yeah, so that, that past data helps you prevent things in the future to some degree, of course. It's not going to be perfect. How specifically geographically can they get with the data they're collecting in the field uh, I mean, they still collect it manually, but it's put into a database. Is that what I'm understanding? There's not like a, there's not like some sort of sensor out there in the field or is there? So, so we can be very precise in terms of location. And again, thinking about food safety, that's a, that's a great question. So, you know, we can be precise down to the row um, that a, a, a head of lettuce was grown in to yeah. figure out everything that happened to that in terms of fertilizer, water, soil, you know, who touched it. And then again, when we think about, you know, if, if, uh, from a food safety perspective, heaven forbid, we find ourselves in an outbreak situation. When you've captured that data correctly, you can tell down to a case and pallet level, uh, you know, where something might have come from. Here's the, the row that it was grown in, and here's the lettuce that we need to pull off the shelves. So in the event of an outbreak, we don't have to just take everything out. We can figure out what was contaminated and, and really allow for continued supply throughout the food chain. Is that when we get the information of lot number 62784 and, you know, this label, uh, you know, uh, shredded lettuce, and then that's the information that you not only ascertain, but you generate? Yep. So, so we're collecting that information di digitally, or we're facilitating the digital collection of that information, and then providing it 
throughout the food chain, because one of the things that a lot of listeners may not know is that, you know, what happens from the time something is, is harvested in the field, there's a number of steps often that are happening before it gets to the grocery store. Whether, you know, if it's a packaged salad, it might go through a facility that's, that's got a fair number of touches on there. You know, it's, it's moving through transportation, it's moving through a distribution center. So our technology would enable the traceability of that product through any sort of transformations uh, so that ultimately if, if we need to have something like a recall or you know tracing it down, yeah, you can do that. The other thing that's really interesting about the industry, and I remember going into some fields several years back and seeing that now they have hand washing stations and all these protocols to keep things clean, and I don't think we had that when we were growing up, right, Rick, in the fields? Did you ever see, Edwin, did you ever see a hand washing station? No, or I, I, Trace, I may have <laughs> told you. Yeah. What was that? Yeah. Only for pesticides. Um, <laughs> yeah. Tracy, and for our listeners and for Tracy, our father grew vegetables in North Carolina. He had a big packing house here and he grew them and packed them for other people as well. So he, he grew cabbage and beans and tomatoes, cucumbers, uh, those were, and amongst other things, but anyway, that's what Teresa's referring to. We were not, there was not much sanitation, but then that right. system, <laughs> it's come up, which, which is one of the reasons why we wanted to have you on today is to give confidence to our listeners that fresh yeah. produce, it's improving. You know, there's always a danger with any kind of food, not that's, just fresh produce. I mean, that's but, a, uh, a chicken sandwich that you get from a restaurant, but I mean, like, yeah, we've come a long way, baby. Right. And it's getting safe, even though, you know, today we hear the news breaks anytime there's any kind of outbreak of anything and people get scared. And uh, but the reality is things are improving. Wouldn't you say so, uh, Tracy? I mean, you, I mean, you've without question. I mean, that was another really enlightening thing for me as a as a consumer of produce to come into this industry and see the incredible amount of thought and care and work that is happening throughout the entire fresh food supply chain at every single level to ensure sanitation, to ensure um, both quality and safety from you know, the, the very initial um, planning of a field to ensure that it's going to be in the right location, safe from outside intrusions, that the water is gonna be safe all the way through. There's so much that, that care and thought that goes into this that, that we're completely unaware of. And yeah, we hear on the news when there's something like an E. coli outbreak and it's um but you know ultimately those are very rare as a result of the work that goes into that let's say that there's bird droppings on one head of lettuce in very row good. six very good and then good. that is put in with all these other lettuce heads which go to to the plant and then they put them all into a, a centrifuge to to wash it for processing which spreads all that around to everything else do they know every time they dump a bin or whatever into the centrifuge to wash it, do they know exactly which lettuce plants were there? So, so they do. And it's a really good question, Rick, because ultimately, you know, you've got multiple um, lots of, of lettuce in our example that are going into that centrifuge. They're, be they're being washed. They're coming out on the other side. So what's happening is as those lots of lettuce are going in, there's a label that was scanned when they were picked out of the field. We know which row they came from, who picked them, on what date. Uh, that label gets scanned when they go into that centrifuge, they get spun around, and maybe some of it doesn't go into the to the first round of bags, goes back. That's actually tracked as well. Okay. But wait a minute. So, so you could yeah. so I think your point, Rick, was could it be isolated to the one head of lettuce? Is that well, at least the batch, so that you know that it was this particular batch that was contaminated. Uh, and I don't even know how many heads of lettuce at a time go into the centrifuge, but uh, it's it's a lot. Yeah. <laughs> and <laughs> and, and then, are they inspecting for these for things like bird droppings and things like that? Part of what's what's happening on those field inspections is is people are are manually observing or visually observing. You know, has there been any sort of animal intrusion? Do we see any footprints? And if if that's observed, um, then uh, depending upon the type of crop, certainly with leafy greens. 
um, that segment of the field and an area around it is going to be cordoned off and, and nothing would be harvested from that area. There's a lot happening today in controlled environment agriculture that's really focused on excluding any sort of outside um, animal intrusion. Uh, it also eliminates the, the requirement to have pesticides. It's a really different way of growing. Uh, but it's something that's rising in popularity as we think about, you know, um, the need to get uh, fresh produce into cities where, you know, right now, in many cases, we're shipping all the way across the country to get our leafy greens. Um, you can, in controlled environment agriculture, you can grow in colder areas year round on a much smaller footprint, and you can eliminate the requirement for things like pesticides, um, eliminate having sort of outside influences. We're going to get to the point where, you know, uh, the, the washing your hands with antibacterial all the time, and then if there's just one little you know, bacteria, you know, we fall down and have a, a terrible cold or something like that. So what you're saying is sick. we're going to we're going to get so clean that our immune systems will go. Exactly. The immune system should be challenged. That's how it stays healthy. But if you read the CDC guidelines, I pulled them up. <laughs> and of course, they say the safest way to eat produce is to cook it. And the second safest way is to wash it. And you can get all these things if you eat uncooked produce. And I'm thinking, but if you're overweight because you're afraid to eat produce and you're eating all kinds of stuff that's not good for you, your health is much more in jeopardy than, yeah, there you go. That, yeah, I won't yeah. say the product name. Okay. <laughs> Filled with sugar. <laughs> <Literally cocaine. laughs> yeah. Yeah, and that's one of our the points we've tried to make in, in our podcast. We talk about it, uh, I'm going to say all the time, but frequently is that, you know, the scares about pesticides, about potential uh, food uh, illnesses, foodborne illnesses. Uh, if that scares you away from eating healthy, fresh produce, uh, your health is going to be is going to suffer <laughs> greatly. <laughs> So, uh, so, and you, and what you think like a, a number four meal at McDonald's is, right. is worse than that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> but let's go back, let's go back to the indoor, um, indoor growing vertical farms, indoor vertical farming. It's, it's expanding, uh, vastly. Can you get more data from those than you can get from a field that's out growing in the, under the sun? <laughs> so that's not really our specialty. Um, I would say that um, most of the indoor farms that you see today are heavily technology enabled. They're really developed yeah. with technology at the forefront. And there's a number of different ways that people are doing it. Um, you know, one of the things that's growing really rapidly is complete, not even greenhouse, but you'll see something that looks like a tractor trailer box. Yep. And um, people are growing vertically and hydroponically. Uh, you can can turn over your, your lettuce in a matter of weeks in that. And um, your shipping is going to be, you know, far less to get it into a, a retailer. Um, so, so there's some, certainly some advantages there um, in terms of time to market and um, in location. I, I, I don't think that we're going to see people moving away from traditional farming. I would certainly hate to see that, but it's, you know, another opportunity um, to get fresh produce to people quickly in market. Yeah. Couldn't you put something embedded on the UPC stickers? You know, if we can chip a dog, why <laughs> couldn't they use that UPC code so that's technology that does exist today, um, whether it's through little pods that might go as part of a transportation process, RFID tags that might be part of- um, What's an RFID tag? Uh, radio frequency ID. Um, so that's essentially like uh, putting a little, a, 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 a tiny little tag on something that allows you to, to, to pick it up by scanning. Um, and pick up the information that's contained on it by scanning. Um, so yeah, there's uh, there's technology today that will track sort of cold chain compliance as you were talking about throughout um, both growing and transportation process because some um, fruits are particularly 
um, at risk with when cold chain compliance is broken. Things like strawberries are going to degrade incredibly rapidly if, if you break the, the cold chain there. And so when you're collecting that sort of technology, whatever it might be, and you're able to layer together the data around all of those environmental factors, um, it can give you, no matter where you are in a supply chain, a lot more clarity around, um, you know, what's the ultimate quality going to be of a product as, as it goes by with time, because obviously the number, number one thing for a consumer is I want the highest quality product that I can get. And I want it to last once it's in my refrigerator or on the counter at my house. Yeah. And your systems, is that information made available to consumers or is it just for the people in the supply chain dis distributing? So our primary, cons our primary clients are going to be the folks within the supply chain. Um, one of the things that we will do with those clients is we can partner to, um, to create QR codes that might be applied to a product or the packaging of a product. And then that QR code can link to um, information about either the growing of the product, um, you know, what's happened to it since the time it's been grown. We can give you information about the farmer, whatever the, uh, the partner wants to surface through, through that QR code, which really, I mean, if we think about it, QR codes have had this big resurgence throughout the time of the pandemic. Before that, we all had to have QR code readers. So nobody was really using them, but now we're accustomed to using them. Yeah. So if you find that on the packaging of your produce, I strongly encourage you give it a scan because you'll be shocked at what you might find out about what, what you're putting into your cart. And a lot of times um, you'll get the opportunity to give feedback on that product as well. So you can give feedback to both the retailer and potentially the farmer around, you know, what was the quality, you know, what did you like about it? So on and so forth. Oh, they're like, oh shit, here she comes again. This woman is like, you know, <laughs> <laughs> block, block the woman in Florida for her comments. Uh, <laughs> Cynthia is known in all the Florida grocery stores as the pest in the produce aisle. She comes down and complains about all the produce and how bad it is. But that that's really interesting. You mentioned that the, the, in that QR code, of course, that QR code could go to a web page that could have unlimited information and one of the things you mentioned that fascinates me is learning about the people who are actually growing it the farmers because a lot of people i think a lot of our listeners even maybe think that um, the fresh produce industry is all big agriculture but the vast majority of the people who are growing your fresh fruits and vegetables are small farmers and and you know relatively small farmers part of a group yeah and mm -hmm. Uh, that to me is one of the things we want to focus on some with Produce Buzz in future episodes is learning about those people who are actually out there working hard, toiling in the fields. Um, so can you talk about that a bit? And are, are you starting to do some of that with your suppliers or is that something in the future? So right now I'm working with um, a couple of different uh, large uh, growers who have, or not necessarily even large, but unique growers. I've, I've, I'm working with a gentleman up in Canada who's growing his strawberries and cucumbers indoors. And um, we've been kind of, you know, whiteboarding how he might want to tell that story through a QR code. Right. Um, and, uh, it, you know, there's, there's a few more across the country that I've spoken with about this idea. Our company actually previously did it with Driscoll strawberries oh. um, as well. Uh, so, yeah, a lot of different ways that people might go about doing that. But I think that there's at the consumer end, um, a real interest in understanding, uh, because I think you're right. Um, there's, I, I think a lot of times a misperception that there's like big agriculture is powering everything. People hear about companies like Monsanto, but in my experience, um, you know, you might have cooperatives who are, are pulling farmers together, but there's a, a, a lot of what we see in stores is coming from, from farms all across the country. One of our customers uh, in, is involved in the berry industry from the standpoint of the, the company has a product called Tectrol and Driscoll is a heavy user of that product. And it's the, they, where they put the bags over the pallets of berries and inject the CO2 into that bag because that cuts down on the, the decay that the berries have. And that's actually a food safety measure because it protects, that protects the berries all the way to the warehouse. Uh, and um, one of the things we do is to check the atmospheres on arrival 
for that product uh, to make sure that it maintained that atmosphere and the company that owns the Tetral process can immediately correct any problems they see. It's a great process for the berry industry to protect their product because with, with the Tetral process, it's sealed. So you know if somebody's tampered with your palate. You know, oh, wow. So that's another, another part of the process of protecting the fruit that some of the shippers use. And you can see that you can see the difference in the fruit when it gets to the consumer. Mm -hmm. It lasts longer. With the QR code process, are you helping them create the data that they put on these QR codes or just providing the service of connecting the QR codes to their so site? We, we easily could include the data that we're collecting as part of that sort of information on the, the website or landing page that you would link to from the QR code, that would be really up to our partner, anything that they wanted to share there. So if they wanted to share, hey, here's what the journey looked like to get these, these strawberries. You know, they came from here. Um, you know, here's some of the processes uh, that we took to make sure that, um, that they were at the, the, you know, the peak of ripeness when they got there. Most of the work that we do is directed towards our enterprise or, or farming or, or brokering clients, right? To give them information that they use around managing their operations or predictive capabilities. But something like a QR code is really gonna be directed at that consumer. So it's marketing efforts usually. Yeah. So the, we've talked to, uh, uh, mostly about food safety today, but we've, you've touched a good deal on the quality aspect of the food supply chain. You've mentioned that if you see a, a QR code on a package, uh, take the time to scan it and yep. that would give you some information. I think that the story is good to tell. And the question is always on the side of the, you know, the marketer or the grower is what does the consumer actually want to see mm -hmm. is, is really what it boils down to because most consumers I think are not that concerned about you know, what pesticides were applied, what sort of activities happened until there's a problem. Our core focus is ensuring that we help them to trace that and have the ability to both at a moment's notice, figure out what happened to something um, throughout its life cycle. But then additionally, you know, whatever it is that you want to share with a consumer about that, you can choose what you want that to I be. See, and, no, and the reason it's typically not food safety information is because most consumers really don't care until there's an issue. Right. On my uh, local news feed, I see a lot of, you know, uh, company products and they'll say, you know, it was sold to three different retailers, the name of, you know, one, two, and three. It was lot number, blah, 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 dump it. I think our goal- So which I think is really, really good. That is, is wonderful when you can get that while you've got the, the product on the shelf. Our goal and when things work work right with, with what we're doing at, at iFood DS is um, when we recognize that something was picked up, you know, there was a, a lot of leafy greens or a lot of, you know, potentially cut and processed apples uh, that there was an issue with that we can really quickly trace back and say, hey, we need to pull the rest of these ones as well before it ever gets to the point we could pull them off the grocery store shelves so that we don't have to clear off all of you know, that, that product, but the ones that would potentially be impacted. Right, because if it was like uh, chopped lettuce, uh, chopped romaine, you don't have to pull off the spinach and the baby kale and the, because if, you know, a Susie Homemaker goes, well, it was, you know, Joan's product. So she will buy nothing because she wouldn't necessarily know the specific uh, commodity. But I think the, uh, the, the thing that I'm most excited about in the progress that's being made here is what some, we addressed earlier in the episode uh, was that, you know, when there's an outbreak, that data can help prevent future outbreaks. And the technology is growing and getting better to adjust and make that happen. So let me ask you this question. And you're, when you're, what you're hearing in your sector of the industry, uh, do you think we can wipe out all E. coli outbreaks in the future? Or is that like saying we couldn't stop the common cold? 
Do, I don't think that we can ultimately wipe it out for forever. No, that's, I mean, you know, when we're growing things in, uh, in nature, this stuff's going to happen. What, right. what we would, would look towards doing is ensuring that it's caught really quickly and without impacting, you know, to mitigate the number of consumers that actually get it into their home um, and not stalling the entire supply chain by having to remove, you know, Everything. all the available product because we don't know which one it is. Right. So out right. of caution, uh, we have to we have to throw it all away. But the reality is, again, I get back to don't let this don't let food Ill, born illnesses scare you from eating healthy <laughs> that's never, thing, absolutely so. not. And, and and more and more is being done to track it and trace it and to eliminate it so uh, i think that's, right. that's, that's the lesson yeah, <laughs> yeah. i'm i'm making uh, mayonnaise from scratch so if a raw egg i'm not worried about a raw egg then you know just yeah. wash your produce <laughs> <laughs> that's right and that's my key takeaway these days is you know wash your fruits and vegetables and eat up yeah yeah we're right. overwhelmingly safe wash your, your fruits and vegetables and enjoy yeah <laughs> very well said very succinct and very to the point so i think we should end on that note Tracy, thank you so much. Thanks for the hard work you're doing and for sharing uh, all about the work that iFood DS is doing to help protect our food and make it better. And we are really thrilled that you joined us today and we wish you all success. Thanks so much for having me on. It was, was a great time with all you buzzers. <laughs> great day, guys. Thank you. Thank Very you. interesting. Thank Thanks. you so much. All right. Well, thank you listeners for tuning in to the Produce Buzzers podcast, brought to you by Produce Buzz, a gathering place for lovers of fresh fruits and veggies. We hope you were entertained a bit and educated a lot about fresh produce. Be sure to join us next time, and please tell your friends to do so as well. Like, share, and comment on our Produce Buzz Facebook page, and check out our website at www.producebuzz.com There you will find articles about fresh fruits and veggies how to select, store, and prepare them as well as lots of interesting facts about all the wonderful bounty the earth provides for us Until next time be fruitful and don't forget to veg out